So now we can start. Are we ready? Yeah. Good afternoon. Just a couple of minutes to check all technical things and So, good afternoon, dear friends. Uh, uh, I'm glad to welcome you here at Ukraine Media Center. Uh, I'd like to remind you that we are supported by the Ministry of Ukraine and Ministry, Ministry of Defense and Ministry of, of Internal Affairs of Ukraine, and our today's topic is situation in heroic city of Chernihiv. Now, uh, we have city mayor of Chernihiv, Vladislav Troshenko, online with us. So, Vladislav, please tell us uh, what's going on in the city and what the current situation. You're welcome. At the moment, Chernihiv, uh, in operational terms, Chernihiv has been sieged and circled. Uh, the enemies have consciously destroyed the only bridge which connected us uh, to the southern direction, to Kyiv. Uh, so, of course, the enemies came from the north, and without having this bridge, uh, the city uh, has no humanitarian corridor, nor any opportunity to uh, move the wounded people or from the city or bring humanitarian aid or medicines. The situation in the city has been difficult, and uh, people are uh, staying strong. The conscious uh, people support the uh, city functioning, critical infrastructure facilities, of course, within the uh, limits. Uh, within the possible limits, we have taken into account that our infrastructure has been ruined. Uh, to large scale. So we support our military, our soldiers and officers of the armed forces of Ukraine, territorial defense, those in the front lines, those who uh, bear the most terrible ordeals. Uh, our citizens are with our army, the mayor is with our army. We are not going to surrender our city. Uh, no way. Why should this ancient Chernihiv now, when we have resisted against German Nazis in 1941-1945, we will also uh, survive against Russian fascists. We will win over them jointly with our armed forces, and our citizens are very firm about that. Vladislav, could you please tell us whether uh, you have electricity, water supply, and everything necessary for the people, like telecommunications? In the city, uh, we don't have stable electricity supply. Of course, uh, we deliver water in those tanks uh, that we find. But the situation with water delivery in city's residential quarters is, so, say, it's not normal as yet, but we have been bringing things to order our volunteers. Volunteer supporters have been working. They're brave, courageous people. They find every opportunity so that even uh, being very close uh, to the combat area where the uh, uh, armed forces of Ukraine uh, are involved in, are engaged in combat action against Russian military, uh, when there, are, there is artillery shelling and uh, assault rifle shooting, uh, still being very close to those places, our volunteers bring medicines, uh, medicines and everything necessary to the people. Uh, they have a huge burden to carry, and they uh, have very much needed uh, things to do. And I, as a city mayor, bow to Chernihiv volunteers and everybody from Ukraine who supports Chernihiv. Thank you, Vladislav. Could you please tell us? Now we'll give the floor to our journalists who are here, who have gathered here in this studio for them to ask you their questions. Please, dear journalists, uh, unfortunately, we have uh, not very stable connection to city mayor of Chernihiv, so we will not take a lot of his time. But if you have any questions, you have this chance to ask them now. Uh, yeah, you're welcome to questions. Question, is there any way still for the civilians to, to cross the river and, you know, to get out of the city? Um, you said one bridge is bombed. Is there another pedestrian bridge or what's the situation? Uh, the pedestrian bridge, the pedestrian bridge, at the moment, is under constant and 
constant shelling from all types of weapons uh, by Russian military. It has been uh, broken, and not currently it's uh, you cannot transport any heavy uh, items over that pedestrian bridge because it, it, it can just completely fall down at any moment. Also, there is a very high risk taking into account that this bridge is being sh shelled, shot at from every direction, and it's very well visible from the big, di from large distance by the enemy. So there are huge risks uh, when one would try uh, for anybody to try and move over that bridge would be a huge risk. Currently, we have been working on identifying other opportunities, other ways to transport humanitarian aid to the city and uh, rem bring the wounded people from the city. Key is evacuation still possible from Chernihiv, could you please tell us? Is evacuation possible? At the moment, this issue is uh, being arranged, but it will not be about mass scale evacuation anymore. It may be that we'll find some opportunity, some technical ability to uh, bring several people, say w heavily wounded people, for example, uh, batches of several people. Now, for example, we are looking for a way to bring 44 heavily wounded people because they would not survive. Uh, we can guarantee that they, they cannot survive in our city, those 44 heavily wounded people, because uh, the surgery that they need and the seriousness of their wounds and uh, 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 does not allow us to uh, uh, provide them with good surgery locally to guarantee their survival. They need urgent evacuation, and we, we have been trying to do it. And we have 44 of such people, mostly military people, but they're also innocent civilians. And among those, there are three children. Thank you. Thank you, dear friends. Do you have any other questions? Thank you. No more questions. Uh, if there are no questions, may, or, or maybe journalists need more time, and uh, and uh, uh, this Zoom conference has been arranged for me as the city mayor to be asked those questions. But since there are no questions, I would like to say to to share some very important information. First of all, for those from Western media, in particular for those from Spiegel, a German magazine, today. I would emphasize the following. The Russians have been consciously shelling on peaceful civilians for several weeks. During several weeks, they have been shelling from all types of weapons and uh, from uh, the air. They have been killing peaceful civilians. There is a lot of testimonies. We have been collecting those testimonies, and they will be used in international courts against Russia. Russia has been consciously committing crimes. Uh, 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 there has been uh, interrogation of those pilots downed. One of them, I think his last name is Krasnoyarsov. He has been downed, and he has been arrested right here in Chernihiv. And that pilot, the Russian pilot, I, I would like to use this opportunity to ask the president of Ukraine on behalf of all citizens of Chernihiv who suffered from this bastard, don't be, trust any one word he said that he was provided with coordinates and he didn't know what to bomb because he was bombing residential quarters. In the daytime, it was about uh, 1 p.m. or 1.30 p.m from a low height without any cloud. There was no cloud. The sky was not cloudy, so he saw where he drops his bombs. And in the same way, all those mortar people, mortar crews, they clearly see, they know that currently they are doing artillery shelling from all types of weapons around the city. And it's not shelling at any uh, military infrastructure, but it's shelling at uh, residential buildings. Uh, apartment buildings, uh, multiple-story buildings, and there are mass-scale testi mass, uh, testimonies. And when journalists ask me, uh, uh, like, uh, how, how much damage has been done to which buildings, you know, for us it's now easier to count those buildings which have not been damaged, which uh, uh, by some miracle have not been damaged as yet. 
the whole city is uh, destroyed completely. Uh, residential buildings, uh, schools, stadiums, uh, hospitals, uh, uh, children's libraries have been bombed. And there are those numbers I have, more than 200 people, innocent civilians killed. Uh, uh, there have been mass scale killings by mine or artillery projectile who hit a line of people, innocent civilians who were, who were just waiting in line to buy bread, to buy some food. So what sort of military infrastructure is there? It's just a food store, a food shop. In the daytime, it was selling food. So it is very important for me to get this message across, to deliver this information to the whole world, to Europeans, to Germans who buy Russian uh, energy uh, resources. They sponsor those shellings. They sponsor the killing of our population. The whole world should uh, know that it's not the war that uh, Russian military runs against some uh, uh, military against some military facilities, at least in the city of uh, Chernihiv. It's not like that. I can say it for sure. It's a war to kill innocent people, innocent civilians. Only fascists can do that. We survived terrible bombing in 1941. We survived, our grandfathers uh, survived through that terrible war and we had victory over Nazis. And we will also win over those fascist Nazis of our days. But a lot of human blood uh, it has been paid and human lives have been paid for that victory. So, by the way, uh, uh, the city of Memmingham in Western Germany, in uh, Bavaria, in Bayern, uh, but that Irish city is our uh, uh, twin city. You know that uh, our nations uh, uh, have reconciliated, and there is a symmetry of Germans who died when Chernihy was liberated in 1943. And currently, this symmetry has been supported and maintained by our municipal utilities, and we maintain proper order there. And I would like to address Germans now, in particular Germans from Memmingham, you German people from the city of Memmingham. Please know that your German government buys those energy resources from Russia. And it doesn't matter whether they pay in euros or in rubles, but in any case, when they purchase those energy resources, they make their contribution into manufacturing of those mines, which then hit the symmetry where their grandfathers have been buried. Please, I want Germans from Memmingham to hear it. I use this opportunity. Please get this message across. Please deliver this message. The whole civilized world has to join efforts and to stop to stop Russian fascists, uh, Russian Nazis in Ukraine, and they have to provide us with weapons to do that. We will manage. When we have weapons, we will uh, manage uh, and win our Russian army. And I am sure, you know, uh, I asked one question. I asked only one question, whether Putin started this war against Ukraine in order to get the city of Chernihiv to take the city of Chernihiv. That's unlikely. Putin needs U Ukraine and Putin needs the whole Europe. Thank you. And there is no guarantee that tomorrow Putin will not uh, go to Poland or Baltic states. There is no guarantee against that. We have one more question. You're welcome. Question <clears throat> one, uh, how many inhabitants, how many people are actually left in the city? And the second, <clears throat> was there also any direct targeting of a hospital in, Cherny in Chernihiv? Currently, I can only provide some approximate numbers, it's like my feeling, my uh, view of the situation. I can tell you that there is about, about, according to my estimates, about 120 to 130 thousand residents out of 285, 290 that we had before this invasion, before this war. And the second question, whether there have been any direct hits, yes, we have had direct hits uh, in hospital number two, city hospital number two, and there was a mortar shelling, and uh, the hospital has been damaged. All those windows have been uh, broken, and there have been people after surgery, after oper operations, and they stay in corridors because it's dangerous, you know, the hospital is located in such a way, uh, which is very dangerous, uh, not, very, not very far from the uh, combat line. And 
uh, one side of those hospital rooms of those wards is on the dangerous side where there was a danger of direct hit of fragments, uh, shell fragments. So those operated people stay in corridors and the temperature, air temperature, there is 10 or 12 degrees Celsius because of bombing, because of shelling. I'd like to repeat, we, we made everything possible to cover uh, those windows with plywood and other materials, but also the roof has been uh, damaged and there is a lot of damage to internal communications, internal utilities. So I will answer your question. Yes, there has been shelling of hospitals, direct hospitals. The uh, district hospital has been destroyed almost completely. Chernihiv district hospital has been almost completely destroyed. But you know that that's a standard situation that a district hospital and a provincial hospital are located in the city of Chernihiv itself. And that district hospital has been destroyed. It was very close. Uh, you know, there was a, a heavy aviation bomb, I think a 500 kilo bomb hit it. And this hospital has been just uh, uh, destroyed with this shock wave. You know, whatever was closed there, you know, it's just aired out and nothing remains, you know. Any more questions? Follow-up question, please. Um, regarding the cancer award for Ukrainian children, uh, there was a report at the beginning of um, March that uh, the children oncology was also affected. And that uh, are these children still in Chernigiv, or um, do they need to be um, evacuated still? Uh, Children from oncology award have been evacuated. The same way we uh, evacuated people on hemodialysis, on artificial kidney, and all those categories of uh, ch people who had to be evacuated, we evacuated them. We only have uh, remaining here, uh, practically in the occupied area, occupied area, psych and neurological mental hospital in Halavin, but uh, it was also managed from the city of Chernihiv. That hospital has already been encircled by Russians. and. And there is a problem. We have not evacuated our geriatric ward. Uh, more about 500 older old people. Uh, they call them. Some people say that the uh, 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 older people's boarding homes. Those are normal people, you know, without any. Uh, uh, any terrible pathology. Those are just people whose children left them, and currently they need evacuation, those elder people. Also, in our city, we still have quite a large number of people at pension age who cannot help themselves. And unfortunately, unfortunately, I have to state that unfortunately, there have been cases when uh, children left uh, when people uh, uh, left uh, their parents in the city and those are uh, people with uh, special needs and for a long time even before the war they could not help themselves and uh, uh, children brought their parents with various diseases to hospitals including people with covid and other diseases and those children those people left their parents they just fled and now those people older people their parents uh, have been uh, supported by the hospitals, by nurses in hospitals, and that's a big burden. That's a big burden on doctors, on medics, because, you know, to support those people, uh, uh, that's an additional burden, and it takes uh, efforts of nurses and uh, junior nurses. And, of course, it would be desirable to prevent this situation from happening. Uh, thank you, Vladislav. One more question. You're welcome. Is it possible to ask the major? Because I mean, I know he's like not military expert, but what we can expect for the next coming days? All of us we have watched what happened in Mariupol that was under siege from three sides. So now in Chernigov, there's only one side that you know humanitarian aid can enter and and, and people can exit from there as humanitarian <coughs> corridor. So, what is his, uh, his 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 analysis for the next coming days? I will answer in a philosophical way, but this is the answer, a very sincere answer, 
completely sincere one, and I'm 1,000% sure about my answer. Everybody involved will be punished properly. And unfortunately, Ukraine will also pay with people's lives, with, its, uh, with people's blood. For 30 years that Ukraine uh, was being destroyed, was being stolen. Now we pay with people's lives because for 30 years we haven't managed to create modern contemporary weapons, modern contemporary states who would be able to uh, respond in 10 minutes to any and every aggressor, even the Russian aggressor, as soon as they cross the border. And we haven't managed to do that, so we pay with our people's life for that. But we have not attacked Russia. It's Russia who attacked us. And I'm sure that Russia uh, wanted to destroy Ukraine as a state, as a nation. But finally, Putin will destroy Russia itself. And Russia will be punished in any case, whatever many victims, whatever we, we would have, whatever many ordeals we would have, Russia will finally pay, will be punished. We are completely sure about that. And I uh, ask uh, my people, our residents, to uh, be patient and God only sends us our deals we can, we can uh, get through. We will survive, definitely. And uh, now our uh, resistance of our lay residents, support, uh, our uh, patients supports our military. And there is some synergy between us, and we'll definitely win. And to do that, we just need time and weapons time and weapons, and victory will be ours. I am 100%, 1,000% sure about it. Russia, uh, in terms of various economic, uh, uh, according to various economic uh, analytics, Russia has been uh, pushed back by 15 years. And this is just the beginning. And maybe Russia will just disappear if it continues its aggressive acts. Vladislav, thank you very much. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you for providing us with this information. Indeed, this is extremely important, and the whole world has to hear about what's going on in the heroic city of Chernihiv. Thank you, and uh, we'll let you go. We understand that uh, you're busy now. Thank you for being with us, dear friends. And now I'd like to introduce our other participants of our briefing. Uh, we have with us uh, our Zoom uh, uh, war correspondent, war reporter Andrei Tsaplienko from One Plus One TV channel Ukraine. Yesterday he was wounded, so unfortunately he has been able to come here, but he is with us uh, online. You see Andrei here. Also in our studio here we have correspondents of TRT from Turkey, Rashid Radwan and Marin Fernandez. Also, we have a well-known volunteer, Vyacheslav Zaporozhets, a volunteer from Chernihiv, who has been now helping in evacuating people, wounded people, from first of all, from Chernihiv. So, if possible, uh, could you please uh, adjust Zoom? So, Andriy, are you with us? Can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you well. Could you please tell us what happened yesterday? How uh, you got under fire, and uh, what is your health condition at the moment? Yesterday we were trying to get to the city of Chernihiv to meet uh, with the mayor Vladislav Troshenko to meet the local military civilian administration in order to uh, report to prepare material about the real situation in the city, which has been. Uh, actually encircled from three sides and almost completely encircled, surrounded. There was only one humanitarian corridor uh, through Anisiv, Anisov uh, town or village. We reached that Anisov and we were warned by the military uh, that we cannot go further. But you know that for journalists there are no obstacles, there is no barrier for journalists. So we tried to get a permission even though the city is being shelled. And by the way, we actually received, obtained that permission. The only thing was we asked to stay aside from the road because when there was a group of people, even civilian people on the road, it would provoke Russians uh, for uh, 
unmotivated aggression for shelling. I heard it many times from the military, but this time I have seen that this is not just about some rhetoric statement, but that's a matter of fact. In that group where we were, there was about 50 people, mostly uh, innocent civilians who just tried to uh, reach the city of Chernihiv to get their relatives from Chernihiv. We were speaking with one of such people, with a volunteer supporter. He had some food in his bag and he was going to bring that food to his relatives in Chernihiv and he really needed to do it because they had no food there. And there was a lot of such people there. And about after, say, 3 p.m., after 3 p.m., we heard some sound uh, of those uh, missiles, those projectiles, and it, it was, uh, those were cassette projectiles, you know, one uh, or two uh, shells, and there was a lot of small, like, explosions, small explosions around you immediately, and it started uh, getting around us. There was that powerful wave, strong wave uh, for seconds. It was approaching us, and we, with Rashid, uh, laid down next to a fence. I covered my head with my hands, and I heard a very strong hit. Uh, I was hit very strongly. And there was a military guy who somehow uh, started uh, commanding the uh, uh, rescue of people. He started looking where to hide civilian people, including us, journalists and local civilians. And when we were looking for that uh, salvation, for that safe location to hide, people told us, Rashid told me, look, you are all covered with blood. I looked at myself and indeed, in my lower part, my whole trousers were covered with blood. We found uh, some basement, we found something, some empty basement, and we uh, went into that basement one, while the shelling continued, and the military started uh, provided, providing me with first aid. And uh, it's uh, quite uh, typical that it was all during the shelling, and the nature of those shelling kept changing. There were those projectiles, uh, smirch uh, rocket systems, as the military told us. Then they started targeting us with 120 millimeter artillery, most of all, most probably acacia artillery systems. They started hitting the village, they destroyed the neighboring house, and it was burnt in fire. And we were lucky because there were natural gas cartridges next to it, and they, would not ex they did not explode. And we thought that maybe we will stay in that basement forever if they explode. But then later, the mortars, 120 millimeters mortars, started shelling, and finally the tank came and started from four or five kilometers, started hitting that Anisova. And it was a typical tank shelling. You see that short time frame bef between the shell leaves the tank uh, and uh, it hits a very short time frame. And I heard something from the military being there. They, the military guy who was with us said, guys, maybe there is a lot of those uh, dead people on top of us, on the ground, those so-called items 200, those dead bodies. And we had every chance to join those items 200, those people who could uh, die in Anisava. And it continued for about an hour and a half. And at the end of that shelling, I was transported, there was a car, car came and I was brought to a hospital and those guys who were not wounded remained there till the end, till the very end of that shelling, they remained at that uh, venue, at that location. We had our, our bulletproof vests, we had our helmets uh, uh, saying press on them, those uh, bright blue uh, vests saying press from the front and from the back. Our car was marked. I don't know whether I saw it from there, but you know, even before they started they sh that shelling, they first sent their drone, and everybody saw their drone there, and that drone was just adjusting their fire online, and I'm sure that they should have seen that those were civilian people there because there was very few there were very few military people there but a lot of civilians and they knew 100% knew that this was the only road the only route the only humanitarian corridor to the city that they want to block 
So they would not stop uh, and they would even go as far as killing innocent civilians to achieve their goal. Andrei, when you left that basement, what you saw there? Well, to be honest, I was in, I was somehow shocked. So I did not pay much attention. You saw, I, I, you know, I just saw some ruins left uh, le to the left side, and I was quickly put into a car and brought, taken from there. But we heard everything. We were there. We heard uh, how uh, houses around us were hit. Uh, projectiles would hit very close to us. That carpet bombing, as they call it. We were tired of counting how many hits were there, you know, every time. We have a video uh, that you provided to us. I think that we'll show that video to you, dear friends. You're welcome to see what happened there, and then we'll continue. Okay, Andrew? Yeah, you're welcome. And I'd like to remind you that in the bottom part, you know, uh, 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 Andre provided us uh, uh, with a car he used there in Chernihiv, so you can uh, go downstairs after we are done. And next to the hotel entrance, this, this car is brought here to this hotel. So you please show the video. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, you, you have to think quickly, you have to think quickly. You got it, uh, got it, you got it, I take that gloves on. You see a wound, you see Andre wounded? You see our journalists present here. Sit down, please. <laughs> go on, go on. You see, you see, look here. This is it, you have a hole here, you see this hole? Yeah, it's there. And here in the back. Look, the glass. Uh, I cover it, and you see the hole here and the hole there. Same that I, same as I have. It was open like that. You see. And so you had to replace your wheel under fire. Yeah. Most importantly, we are alive and relatively healthy. I have been uh, lightly wounded. Uh, the doctor says uh, you have been very lucky uh, that uh, there has been soft tissue wounded. Uh, we are very glad that Andre has been so lucky. Andre, you're with us. Now I'd like to give the floor to your colleagues who were next to you, Rashid Radwan and Marine Fernandez. Please uh, tell us about your impressions from what happening, what happened there uh, yesterday in Chernihiv. Actually, just so you know, like a few part of what happened. Uh, the thing is, we were out of the city trying to enter, as our colleague from the Spiegel is <laughs> trying to understand how we can reach the city. So, you know, I mean, which is the journalist, you know, must do. So the thing is, like, we're like 10 kilometers from the front line. Uh, and I would like to say something, because we journalists that we are used to cover wars, you know, and uh, conflicts and maybe, you know, different kind of things. Uh, at certain point, when we are here in the shelling at 10 kilometers, we feel safe. So it's not like that. What happened to us yesterday that we were like just arrived, waiting for a permit, safe, calm, just planning how to enter, what is the safest way, if we enter, how, how we will go out from, from, from the city. And suddenly in like, I can say two, three seconds, the shelling was on, 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 on us directly. So I remember just hearing the shelling, like an intense sound, a wave, uh, panic. Uh, we just, just you know, land in the floor. I just in, in in this side we were having kind of wall, and the rocket hit exactly in the other side, eight meters, ten meters probably. Uh, Nacho was uh, he he tried to hide next to the car. You can see how this uh, shrap you know from from the plasters you know just uh, perforate you know the door of the car. 
completely. So uh, I remember perfectly that uh, I, I, I was behind Andre and I put my head and, and you know, between the legs of Andre to cover myself. I had no time to, to, to put my helmet because we were just far away in a civil area. In civil area. We, we didn't expect any kind of, of shelling. And uh, you know, just thinking now that this shrub that you know, hit Andre, 20 centimeters down can hit my head, you know? I mean, you can see this kind of damage and uh, we just run, uh, nowhere to hide, no, no exit plan, uh, just a flat area, uh, shelling and shelling and shelling, uh, smoke. After we, we, we end up in a basement, uh, also, we were not sure if the basement can really support, you know, a, a heavy shelling. They keep shelling like for one hour, two hours. Uh, I, I think the military guys were, were, were really like smart and, and they keep calm because uh, I, I didn't know if the best thing to, to do is to stay there or to try to, to, to run, you know. I mean, you, you are not sure because if this basement, you know, like is under shelling for a long period of time, we could have died there, honestly, you know. We were hearing, like, the house behind us on fire. Cars, you know, start exploding, the deposits, you know, and, uh, you know, and next to us. We didn't know if, you know, we have dead bodies or, you know, really, really uh, hard situation. Of course, journalists never be, you know, it must be the story. The story is about the civilians. And we were just, you know, trying to give a, a wide picture, you know, about... What, what's going on there? Uh, but also, this is another you know, reflection for, for, the, for the viewers, you know. Uh, you watch the war on TV, and uh, the war is about, uh, of course, you are sad, and, but it's about numbers, and it's really, really, really far away, you know, from your daily life. I mean, you go to job, you come back, you watch Netflix, but, you know, I mean, the war is there, it's real, people die, I don't know, you know. So when, when it's really, like, hitting you, like you sit in... The civilians inside inside Cherniev is, 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 is really something to think about, you know, to, to, to stop it. Because at the end, it was about, about numbers, long time, one week more, maybe 300 people, you know, will, will die more. So just kind of I'll think about it. Thank you. Well, I don't think there is much to, to add to what my colleague uh, Rashid and Andre uh, uh, said. And, um, I just hope uh, this our, our story could help to illustrate what they actually, what the people in Chernihiv they are actually going through. You know, uh, we went under the fire for for hours and we end up terrified and we are here. You know, the, this is big show uh, uh, happened for us. And but the, the, the people who are actually inside the city is going through this situation uh, for days now. So um, besides just uh, what my, my colleagues said. Um, I just wish that our account could help to, to illustrate what um, they're going through. Uh, yeah. Okay, maybe now let us give the floor to one more speaker and then uh, we'll go for questions and answers. So I'd like to ask you, we have our well-known volunteer working in Chernihiv, Vyacheslav Zaporozhets. Yesterday, as far as I understand, he also was there in that place and he managed to save somebody's lives there. Vyacheslav, you're welcome. Yeah, I'm Vyacheslav Zaporozhets from Center for Saving Lives, a volunteer organization. Uh, we are working uh, uh, in medical area. We help uh, in evacuating wounded people, both civilians and military, from those hot spots. First time I got to Chernihiv was on the 8th of March. We used our own cars with my friends. We were evacuating peaceful civilians. The last time, the last time, the vacation from Chernihiv was planned for the 23rd of March. In the morning, that road bridge uh, uh, was destroyed by invaders, and we uh, came to terms with the city uh, administration that people will live through pedestrian bridge and we'll get them from there. On the 23rd of March, about 150 people uh, left Chernihiv, and these were the last people who left Chernihiv without any injury. For example, at uh, 6 p.m. PM we, uh, we got a girl 18 years old, and her child was two years old. And we got there at 6, and in half an hour, a shelling against pedestrian bridge started. It was on the 23rd of March. What does it mean? It means that that operator was uh, 
watching how people leave the city and they adjusted their fire. And thank God that after 6 p.m. we did not uh, uh, bring people there anyway because the the, mo uh, the bridge was damaged. And we uh, transported people from there on the 23rd of March. But I understand that there are about 100 people in city hospitals, those seriously uh, ill people in those hospitals, and we look for various ways, and we work with city of, with city administration to find some ways uh, to take those people. Uh, some of them cannot even walk on their own feet to get them from the city. On the 24th, uh, there was shelling in that bridge, and so it was impossible. Then it became quieter. And for yesterday, for the 25th of March, we planned to take three children out of there. They have been heavily wounded in their abdomen, in their extremities. One of those children can walk while uh, the other two should be carried. And we set the task for ourselves. And yesterday, we agreed upon uh, this is something with the military. Uh, they provided us uh, with their uh, support and with one uh, lady to check whether it works. And it was about 1 p.m. that military unit was transporting that lady from there. They crossed the pedestrian bridge, and as soon as they left the pedestrian bridge, artillery shelling started. Unfortunately, that woman, born 1976, my age, uh, she was heavily wounded in her chest and three ribs, uh, 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 and, and, and there was a motorx, and luckily the military bro guys brought her, brought that lady to uh, Kulikivka hospital, and we, and uh, she had a surgery there, and she had been transported to the town of Nizhen, and there she also uh, was provided with medical aid, and today we are relocating her from Nizhen to Kiev. When those three journalists were in Nisova, we were approaching it. We were approaching Anisova. And all those terrible things, you know, I did not believe that it's possible. You know, Anisov is just 30 houses, a small village, and we saw how that shelling started from mortars, Mortar shelling. It's all confirmed, you know. At 3 p.m., those guys uh, have been shelled, and we were near Anisova, and then the tank started shelling. That tank approached the village itself. So somebody, <clears throat> it means that somebody reported that volunteers are here in this village, and there was no mil there are no military guys, no military equipment. There were just volunteers like me. And this tank approaches and starts uh, hitting it directly. As a result, uh, we uh, get some cadet from Kharkiv Tank Military Institute. Uh, we, uh, he, he was leaving uh, Kharkiv before that. He left Kharkiv before that, and that cadet, uh, that military cadet, uh, had a confusion, and when I was transporting him to Kyiv in, in my ambulance car, he told me in every detail that he saw the tank visually, the tank approached and started hitting that village of Anisova directly. So it's uh, all in line with what Andri told you. Uh, it's terrible. Those invaders, uh, they are like animals, they are like terrorists. I think the, the best description of this enemy is Terrorists, they are terrorists, terrorists who uh, act in an organized way to destroy peaceful civilians, to kill peaceful civilians, and they don't allow even evacuation of wounded people. If some of those terrorists hears me, hears me, please give us one day to take wounded people through that pedestrian bridge. Heavily wounded people. There are three children who will who die otherwise. There are about 50 people. You know, <coughs> we need one day to to provide women surgery. 100 people there. Please, we can we can we can put uh, white shorts on, and you'll see that we'll only carry those wounded people over that pedestrian bridge, and we'll use ambulance cars to take them from there. I'd like to really really ask are you. Are you Please let us take those 100 wounded people from there. Please stop killing innocent civilians. Provide us with humanitarian corridor. That's terrible. 
How can it dare, you know, you bring your tank and it hits that village where there is no military in that village? I hope you'll hear me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vyacheslav. Thank you, dear journalists working in those uh, uh, emergency conditions for the whole world to see what is happening in Ukraine. I'd like to thank every volunteer saving our people in every way possible. Uh, George, dear journalists, if you have questions, you're welcome to ask them. Use the microphone, please. <clears throat> The first question is maybe we ask, I ask the questions bilaterally, so not in order to hold everybody up, or I can do it now. Um, actually, question, first of all, you know, great that you all got out, and bravo for you know, uh, your effort. Um, how did you check the way up to that village from, um, from Kiev? How was the way? Did you check with the military before? Did you to go to the village with an escort, um, can you clarify a bit? That would be great. First question. Uh, actually, we didn't go with, with, with any, you know, like uh, escort or anything like that because uh, I think it's quite safe till a certain area. Uh, I mean, you can say more or less that there is an area where is the, the front line, but this area, as my colleague said, is where all the civilians and the humanitarian aid, you know, is ready to enter and also is the exit to evacuate civilians from inside. So we were working very closely with, uh, with Andrei Tsaplienko, he's local uh, journalist, you know, so he checked, uh, we work with him like, in different places, different countries. And as he's local, you know, we were like following, you know, what the information that we were receiving from, from inside the city, from the governor. And we were advised that at that time, at specific time, was uh, really dangerous to cross uh, the, 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 the bridge, you know, not the bridge, you know, the area before the bridge. So we were waiting in order to have like a kind of window, you know, to enter and the, the shelling started. Yeah, but we, we felt like it was pretty safe up until we get to the to the small village that we're talking about, to Iskola Anisov, right? Or, um, so up until there, the, the feeling that we had, it was of uh, safety. I mean, all, all things considered that we are at war, but for example, um, when, when the shelling started, we were by the car, I was just smoking a cigarette, we were just having a chat. And the thing is, it, it, was, a, it was a peaceful day on the village. I saw an old lady riding her bicycle, there was a man carrying some grocery stuff. And the whole thing just changed within like literally 10 seconds. We, we just heard the noises and then, you know, we, we just jumped on the ground and, and we were under fire for four hours. But up until then, it was a peaceful, sunny morning in, in, in a war country, which is true, but it, the whole thing, it didn't feel like we were crossing the enemy lines or anything, if that was your question. Um, you referred to a drone before. You said there was a sound uh, of a drone. May, may, may I ask you, uh, may, may I tell you? So we were sure, at the moment, we were sure that at least one humanitarian corridor uh, is operational. And we were aware that it, it could be possible a dangerous situation, but normally this is an operational humanitarian corridor. So we were informed about all the spots, all the you know points of uh, moving from Kiev to uh, to Chernigiv, and uh, you know ev every official, every official involved in this story was aware about uh, our presence in the in the area. And uh, I'm sure, I'm sure because uh, because I know the the level of Russian intelligence. Russian intelligence also was aware about of journalist presence in the region. Yeah, that was the direction of my question. I'm not. Um, so question. I think I think when uh, when my uh, my colleague uh, volunteer says about uh, you know a terrorist attack towards civilians. That is true. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not questioning. What, what we see on the ground is an attack of terrorist state to the civilians. Nothing more. Can I? I'm not questioning your caution or your professionalism. Um, just for me to clarify, because I, I also am interested to, to go there at some stage because it is such an important story. Um, uh, so let me get back to the question of the drone. You said there was a drone circling. You've probably heard the zzz, whatever in the air or, or not, and then. 
Yes, we heard we heard the sound of uh, UAV. Mm. And then, how long did it take for, uh, for the shelling to start? And also, we uh, we were warned. Uh, we were warned by uh, there were some you know some some military guys controlling the uh, the passage. I think two or three people in the uniform with the uh, with the small arms, and they told us uh, that this is drone, this is Russian drone, and normally. Normally, when you see a Russian drone, uh, an immediate artillery attack would occur. Uh, the colleague is asking how much time has passed after you saw the drone after... How many minutes? Any, one minute, two, two minutes? Five minutes, ten minutes. Mm, I think uh, up up to five minutes. Okay, so b basically the learning is next time you hear a drone, you know, get to a basement or run away, right, or drive away. Well, I, I think so. This is what my experience yeah. says to me. Yeah. Uh, how how to, how to say? Yeah. Uh, it's not really clearly that you hear a drone and you run. I mean, uh, I mean maybe it's, it's easier to see it like that. It it, it looks like. Quite simple. I hear the drone. I hide. I'm safe. Uh, I can tell you, you know, by experience. Unfortunately, it is not like that, because you don't hear the drone really clearly. You don't see it. It's confusion. There is uh, people trying to get in. People trying to get out. Civilians shelling. You see the smoke. You know, you, you can see clearly how they are shelling the city. You are a bit far away. So probably, you know, it, it, it catches you by, by, by surprise. Otherwise, no one will die at war. You know, <laughs> it will be like easier. Microphone, please speak into the microphone. Please speak into the microphone. Yeah, and, and, and I'm not taking it as a criticize. I'm just saying that uh, I think if, if, if you want to know the advice, like it's just, uh, I think it's not safe to go there. It's really high risk. And uh, I don't know, it's like 50-50, you can make it or you cannot. It's really, it's, I don't know, you know, I'm, 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 really, I'm telling you that yesterday, I mean, we were born yesterday, we said that after, after the incident. Because the, the 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 rocket with the clusters was just eight meters, ten meters from our car. But if it's four meters, all the cluster will be on us. Just one shrub, you know, hit Andre yesterday. But otherwise, we'll be full, you know, of 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 of, of clusters. So we, we couldn't make it. Uh, I don't know. In my personal case, you know, it's like still under shock because it's just because we are lucky, you know. There is there is no other reason. So yeah, it's it's really unsafe. Okay, but I mean, bravo for going there. Um, how long did the shelling take place? How long did it last? Sorry, and um, what do you think? Uh, why, think did, why did uh, they stop? Why did they I stop? I think uh, at least one hour and a half. Please speak into the microphone. Uh, until like five, and then the tank started. Any more questions? We were from th three or t I think till till five, something like that, in that basement. Uh, I can tell you that I've, I, I felt like 10 years. <laughs> this couple of hours were like 10 years of my life. So, you know, like, because- There were like several different rounds with some small breaks in between. That's when we'd run from where we were, you know, from where when we were at the beginning from the car. There was like, I don't know, like a, a lot for like, I don't know how much, like 10 minutes, something like that. And then we were able to run inside the village where we hide again, when we put our on the ground again. And then it stopped for a few seconds and then we were able to run to the shelter. And then it, you know, it, it was constantly shelling, but there's some breaks in between. So it's not like it's, it's shelled for four hours nonstop. There is some small breaks of like one minute and then you will hear another explosion. And there's also the cars who went on fire explode and then the house that we are nearby also explodes. So there were a lot of yeah. different explosions. It was actually, we were inside the basement and we could try, we were trying to identify by the sound, like what was exploding, was it a car, is it a house? Is it our car? You know, that's kind of stuff. But it's not like with, you know, like a rhythm for four hours, it's just, it went like a lot of rockets were thrown, a small break, then different rockets, you know, like Andre said, um, so it was kind of random, but for a long period of time, I can't tell you. Microphone? <laughs> <laughs> Any 
колеги. Dear colleagues. What is the moment when to leave? You know, if it is so random, like shelling, 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 stop, well, shelling, shelling, stop, and then when do you actually, you know, go? Well, we were lucky because we were with a with some uh, with some army personnel of the Ukrainian military who who have obviously more experience uh, than us and they've been trained. So, and after like yeah, that couple of hours that we were talking about, roughly, the the explosions stopped, and we saw that there would be. A, a window of opportunity for us to leave. The first, the, some, the army personnel went out and when they saw it was clear, uh, they told us to to go out and and they basically they put us on a car, they took us to the end of the village where our car was already there, I don't know who moved it. Because we also like, when we start running, we run in different positions. So our driver, for example, he didn't make it with us to the shelter. We were very super worried about him, but there was no, no phone connection to you know, to be able to communicate with him. So, um, but luckily, uh, when, when they took us on a different car to the end of the town, our car and our driver were already there. Uh, it was it was such a relief to see him there, and that you know uh, that the car also didn't have any flat tire or anything, and that we could just you know go out from there. <laughs> Dear colleagues, your military journalists, I understand that uh, you have been to various hot areas many times. Is this, uh, is my understanding correct that this has been the first so dangerous situation in your experience? Uh, maybe, uh, maybe our foreign colleagues will answer on the new Andre. Yes, because I don't know, I, I covered several conflicts, but here we are talking about cluster bombs, uh, heavy weapons in civilian areas, indiscriminate shelling in, 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 in civilian houses. You can see clearly how uh, a village house is on fire. The co no, 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 you know, I mean, heavy weapons uh, is something quite serious, you know, it's not a Kalashnikov or a militia. It's like, it's, it's randomly, I mean, if it's like five meters next to you are dead, maybe with eight meters just injured, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's just a matter of lottery, I think. It's quite unsafe even even to cover it. I'm I'm, I'm not sure, but of course, uh, with this level of, of danger, of, of of course, it's challenging for the journalists to cover such kind of events because you you can pay it with your life. You know, I mean, as I said, it's it's really unsafe situation. Also, we find that basement because we were lucky. Uh, not sure how the basement can support that shelling. It was quite a shocking situation, unless for me, you know. Yeah, it, it, it's probably one of the most dangerous situations I've been with. But like I said at the beginning, I want to repeat it again. I just, we shouldn't be the story here. Uh, we just were under fire for, you know, a short amount of time. And uh, I just really hope that this doesn't become like a show of the journalists being, you know, shot at. But that our account will help to illustrate what the people in Chachanihi that have no connection and cannot talk with the journalists uh, can illustrate the experience of them who have been under fire for days. Uh, at some point, like, you know, my family is, is, lives in Madrid, they're all safe, my house is there, you know, if I tomorrow I want to go back, I'll just, you know, go to Poland, buy a ticket, go to my home, you know. This is not the situation of the people there. So I really think, you know, um, besides all that we have been telling you, and, and I'm thankful for the media press and for the colleagues who have been asking the questions, and I'll be answer all the questions that you guys ask. Um, no, no, we can. Uh, yeah, so that's what I'm saying. Like, it should it just help to it should just help to illustrate what is going on for the people who's actually living under the siege. We Ukrainians, вам теж дуже вдячні. We Ukrainians also thank you for being here, for covering the situation, for telling your respective countries about what's actually going on here. Andrei, now the same question for you: uh, Is this the hottest uh, event in your journalist career? Dangerous moments in in my in in my professional career, and uh, I want to mention that you know when people say uh, that uh, you know Russian-Ukrainian war is the uh, biggest invasion after World War II, it's not just words. Uh, I I have to tell you guys that this is this is this is much more this is much more worse than Syria or Bosnia 95. 
and uh, I'm afraid it's just the beginning. Thank you. Thank you, Vyacheslav. I see that you'd like to add something here. Welcome. I will still, I'd still like to say that I did not expect it. You know, when one sees that there are innocent civilians living, you know, to start a mortar shelling, they don't destroy a pedestrian bridge, and that's uh, like a trap. And people start going over that bridge, and they hit those people. And then second point, when the tank comes and starts hitting that village, you have to understand that at any end, at any point in Ukraine, their tank may come and start hitting peaceful civilians. You have to tell people about that, and something should be done about that. Because when I see wounded people, when I see people leaving their houses, just terrified civilians, that's terrible. That's terrible. We have to stop it. We have to stop it jointly with your assistance, with our friends uh, from the whole world. We have to stop it. I would also like to add. Uh, uh, one important thing. Some thing which I consider is very important. Uh, what the plans? Uh, so the plans are to close the siege over Chernigov, to close 130,000 people in the city, and to repeat the tragedy that happened in Mariupol. Uh, so I think I, I think Ukrainian army is absolutely capable to to destroy their plans to to deblock to deblock uh, Chernigov, uh, but uh, only under one condition: uh, the operation uh, provided by Russia is multi-component operation. Uh, the main component is air strikes, air strikes and missile rocket strikes to Chernigov. And if we control the sky, if we close the sky, I think Ukrainian army would be able, would be capable to deblock the city. So that's why, that's why we all, we all Ukrainians, we urge. European partners, we urge Mr. Biden to close the sky or at least to deliver us appropriate weapon to do so by ourselves. This is the main thing. Uh, this is the main thing because, uh, you know, every day, every minute of delay costs lives, lives of innocent people. Thank you, Andrei. Thank you, Andrei. Thank you. Any more questions? No more questions. OK, then I'd like to thank everybody here. I'd like to thank you, Andrei. Wishing you uh, good health, uh, getting well as soon as possible. Dear journalists, everybody in the studio, all our speakers, I'd like to thank you for being with us. Thank you for covering the situation in Ukraine. And of course, I would like to ask, thank our volunteers who uh, do everything possible in order to save our people. Thank you. And now you're welcome to go downstairs and to see the car uh, which was used by our journalists yesterday when they uh, got under that shelling. Uh, and there's our cameraman with that car, Ruslan Hanushak. Uh, he was with us, and he can also command on that uh, situation if you need it. Okay, you're welcome to go downstairs, and we'll see you here at 3 p.m., and we'll have a spokesperson from the Ministry of Defense of Ukraine. He'll tell us about the operational current situation on the front lines now. Thank you, and stay with us. Thank you. Goodbye.